Welcome, everybody. We're excited that you could join us for the Bullying and Cyberbullying Focus on Native American Youth with Disabilities. Uh, my name is Judy Wiley. I'm the Program Manager for the Native American Technical Assistance Center. Um, one of the highlights that we want to highlight um, during this webinar is the resources that um, Joanne developed in January of 2017. Joanne, I can't believe it's been a year <laughs> since you developed this. <laughs> and um, we're just now doing a webinar on it. But um, in January of 2017, um, Joanne developed a resource guide where you can go to get more information um, on, on um, agencies that are working on bullying or cyberbullying. There are some agencies that work specifically with Native people. The Indian Health Services um, had a, a bullying prevention campaign called Stand Up, Stand Strong. And um, they have posters. There's a video link to Native youth on it. Um, so we highly encourage you to go to that resource that's posted over in the um, right-hand corner. Um, Samson is another one. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration um, provided a lot of um, briefing papers and fact sheets on cyberbullying, specifically prevention for Native youth. So um, again, um, what we're hoping you'll learn from this webinar is not just what's going on in Indian country regarding bullying and cyberbullying and some of the areas that our Native um, kids with disabilities um, um, deal with, but also that this would be a resource for you um, as parent centers, because we know all parent centers have a curriculum to um, to teach to the community on bullying because it ha has such a high number um, how it affects our kids with disabilities. So um, this again is just another resource, another tool for you to pull out of your toolbox. But the reason this is unique is it will actually help you get access into Indian communities because all Indian communities are dealing with this um, uh, kind of devastating effects that bullying and cyberbullying has on our kids. So we hope that you will be able to use this curriculum as kind of um, a way to access Native communities and also to learn facts about what's happening in Indian country as far as bullying and cyberbullying. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker today. Um, she's one of uh, the Native American Technical Assistance Center's writers and also one of our trainers for our Native American Specialist Program. And her name is uh, Joanne Sebastian Morris. She has over 35 years of experience in the education field. She's originally from Michigan, and Joanne is Salt, uh, Salt St. Marie Chippewa on her father's side and Mohawk on her mother's side. She earned a bachelor's of education degree from the University of New Mexico and a master's degree on cultural anthropology from UCLA. Joanne started her career as a high school English teacher. And if you ever have seen her edit my papers, you would know that to be true. She puts it in red ink and highlights it. Um, <laughs> And she also uh, moved on um, and held positions in administration and research. A high point of her career, which Joanne, I did not know this till I read this, and this is Holy Moses, Mother Mary stuff. Um, at one point, she served as the director of Indian education at the Bureau of Indian Education in the U.S. Department of Interior. I did not know that, so we have to chat later on about what that was like. Um, for the last two years, um, Joanne has engaged in teacher training at the regional and national levels. Her most, uh, most recently, she had work, has worked for the National Education Association in Washington, D.C. Um, Joanne retired two years ago and resides now in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and she has happily she was happily recruited by the NABTAC team 
to join in the Merry Band of Consultants over a year ago. Can't believe it's been a year either, but um, we're so happy to have you, Joanne, on our, our, our training staff and then our writing staff, and now as a presenter for our webinar. So without further ado, um, uh, I'm gonna let Joanne take it over from uh, for now on. Thanks, Joanne, thank you for presenting. Well, thanks, Judy, and greetings to everybody who is attending our webinar today. I'm at the Ethics Office here in Albuquerque, and I'm delighted to, to be able for us to spend some time together today. And I appreciate your interest in this topic. So um, let's see, we're gonna move right into, into the slideshow. We're, as we know, and as Judy said, bullying is a national problem for all youth, all children and youth. This fact is equally true for American Indian, Alaskan Native youth, yet there are few opportunities for Native parents to learn about bullying, how to spot it, and importantly, how to prevent it. So this webinar is provided to parent center staff as a means to model a training or webinar that you can deliver to Native parents and communities by offering this content to Native parents, as Judy said, it covers a topic that they know is relevant to them and it will make a real connection with our communities that will enable further outreach activities and services. The objectives for today's webinar are on the next slide. I think it's just coming up. I think there's, yeah, Kelsey warned me there's a bit of a pause, so in, um, we'll get used to this. So we have one main objective and three important sub-objectives. The main objective is to assist parent centers in their outreach to Native parents by first, increasing awareness of bullying in general and its impact on our American Indian and Alaska Native communities, particularly those with dis disabilities. Increasing your awareness of cyberbullying and sexting. And lastly, learning bullying prevention strategies that parent centers can share with Native parents. This is strictly an awareness session today given our, our time frame, but we do address three forms of bullying among school-aged youth, in-person bullying, online bullying, which is known as cyberbullying, and sexting, an extreme form of online bullying. The progression of the webinar is as follows. I'll introduce the topics of bullying, cyberbullying and sexting, and note the impact of each behavior especially on Native youth and those with disabilities. Specific information about what parents and youth can do to prevent the various forms of bullying are provided. Also, three NAPTAC resources will be cited at the close of the webinar. Okay. The next slide offers a definition that is used on the U.S. Department of Education's very informative website, Stop Bullying. You'll find lots of good information on that website. And again, key words are unwanted, unwanted aggressive behavior that involves a power imbalance, and we'll talk about the, each of these in a minute. Behavior is repeated. Those, the words that are underlined are really critical. So this is, this is a, this again, excuse me, it's a definition that is still up on the department's website. But about seven years ago, the Ed Department funded a year long study group composed of nationally known experts in the field of bullying prevention. The intent was to arrive at a national definition of bullying 
prior to this research project, each state could, and many still do, define bullying behaviors as they saw fit. The next slide provides the key elements of the national definition as announced by the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control. You'll notice similarities with the Ed Department's definition. Again, in the national definition, the bullying is an attack or intimidation intended to cause fear, distress, or harm. And again, in the Ed Department's definition on the previous slide, it said unwanted aggressive behavior. So the intent is, is a critical piece in the definition. Bullying involves the real or perceived power imbalance. And so that's the, that's the same as the uh, department uh, website definition. And bullying is repeated attacks between the same students or youth over time. And repetition was also a key point in the Ed Department's definition. Well, it can be direct, such as hitting, kicking, stealing, or damaging one's property, or threatening another, calling one derogatory names, and humiliating another in public. Well, it can also be indirect, such as spreading rumors about a person, telling another secrets, or excluding someone from a social group. Regarding the second bullet, uh, talking about power imbalance, school-age youth who bully often target others perceived as weak, such as youth with disabilities. Um, or a loner, such as someone new to the neighborhood or community, are those who are different racially or linguistically, especially youth of color, and immigrants and native youth who speak their traditional languages, or youth whose families are poorer than most, such as those living on an Indian reservation, or youth for their perceived sexual orientation. On the next slide, we see um, the, the, the distinction between bullying versus normal conflict. Often parents mistakenly think that bullying is the same as normal youthful conflict. It isn't. These are the three ways, three basic ways to know the difference. Again, the youth who bullies enjoys seeing his or her target upset. That's intense. Again, that's key in this definition. Youth who bully selects a target who's smaller, younger, less socially able or to cope or disabled. That's the power imbalance piece. And the third one, third uh, way to tell the difference is the youth who bully picks on the target repeatedly. It's a repetition issue. So it's not just kids being kids, kids rough housing. Bullying is different from normal conflict. Nationally, most research indicates one in three students are bullied, quotes, moderately to frequently. And it continues to be one of the most common forms of aggression and what's called peer victimization experienced by our youth. Bullying is most common among elementary and middle school aged youth. On the next slide, we talk about the impact of bullying. There are three key impacts, as you see on the left. It increases absenteeism and decreases academic success, creates feelings of helplessness, anger, so on. Bullying uh, in, can increase the possibility of suicidal thoughts. Regarding that, it, bullying causes mental, physical, and emotional damage to all involved. And research has shown the effects are long lasting. Among the statistical uh, impacts, the uh, bully students are five times more likely to be depressed. Boys are more likely, four times more likely to be suicidal. And bullied girls are eight times more likely to be suicidal. Researchers believe that girls tend to be, to engage in suicidal thoughts and actions because 
They are more active online on social networking sites than boys are. Unfortunately, we frequently read about young people who have committed suicide for having been bullied and all too common occurrence among native youth. As parents and staff at parent centers, we should be committed to creating safe home and community environments for vulnerable youth. If school-aged youth are in fear of physical harm or are suffering from stress and sleep disorders due to bullying, they may experience the following. The inability to focus on schoolwork, poor grades, withdrawal from after-school activities, or dropping out altogether. The bottom line, our youth can't learn and mature emotionally if they are in fear. The good news, bullying is solvable and we can help. Now what I'd like you to do is to think back to your days as, to your childhood days, to your days as a student. Were you ever, I thought I hit the move forward, I'll hit it again. Were you ever a youth who bullied others? Were you the target of a bully? Were you a bully target? By that we mean someone who was bullied and in turn bullied others then. Or were you a bystander? That's a term that people use to describe somebody who's witnessed the bullying but did nothing to stop it. So they're called bystanders. So again, think back to your days as a youth, as a, as a young person in school, elementary, middle school aged. And did you, were you in one of these four roles? During in-person training sessions, many people usually recall being a target of a peer who bullied them and others. Other training attendees even admit that they bullied peers when they were young. In one example, uh, an, an, an educator, a male educator who I was working with said, he still lives in the same town he grew up in and feels guilty every time he sees the parents of the boy he used to bully back in elementary school. I've witnessed other adults who still feel guilty for not helping a friend when they were bullied, again, many years ago. Let me ask one more question of you. For those of you who were bullied, how many remember the name of the person who bullied you? Again, during in-person training sessions, Usually many hands go up. I raise these questions with you to make the point that bullying is not child's play. It's not just boys being boys or girls being girls. It carries long lasting effects. I'd like to make just another quick comment regarding bully targets. Research has found that it's not uncommon for youth who are bullied due to their disabilities, meaning that, yeah, they were, they were a target because of that, they in turn may t turn to bullying other students or youth with, bully with disabilities, excuse me. In terms of native youth being targets of bullying, while we may not have the, all of the data only on American Indian and Alaska Native youth, it's hard to find national statistics for our young people sometimes. A national U.S. study found that one in five students of color report being bullied specifically for their race, the first bullet on the slide. And then also youth, Native youth are bullied because of their cultural and linguistic differences. And because there are negative stereotypes and misconceptions about uh, Indians, about our people, that are still that still exist and encourage racist beliefs and behaviors. 
Unfortunately, stereotypes about us have existed since historical contact. Currently, tribes and native groups still struggle against demeaning caricatures of our race, such as the many Indian team mascots and even commercial logos. On the fourth bullet above, we also see that youth are, are targeted for growing up in poverty and for having low cultural self-esteem. It does seem that youth who bully do have a sense of who to target, those who are most vulnerable. Poverty isolates youth and can make Native youth easy targets in predominantly white schools. When Native youth excel academically and go against the negative stereotype that they don't do well in school, there may be jealousy and backlash by other youth, Native and non-Native. So that's the fifth bullet on this slide, that they may be bullied for excelling in school. Now, we also know from the research that youth with disabilities are bullied two to three times more, more than students without disabilities. Based on their disability, they may have, youth with disabilities may start out with limited communication skills, difficulty interpreting social cues, lower social standing, academic difficulties, limited ability to participate in physical activities, and lower self-esteem. Again, these differences make them especially vulnerable to bullying of all sorts. Recall the definition of bullying, where one of the key traits is a power imbalance, where the target has less power, whether that's a physical weakness or less social status or a disability. Also, those who bully like to target youth who are different from them in some way. Already facing academic and social challenges, the self-esteem of youth with disabilities can be impacted severely by bullying. If you add race-based bullying to this question, Native youth with disabilities face even more challenges as they move through their schooling and through life. We'll now move to a short discussion of cyberbullying. And cyberbullying includes sending or posting harmful material or engaging in other forms of social aggression. And again, it's using internet or other uh, digital devices. This the author who I cited here, Nancy Willard, is an attorney, and she has, uh, she has authored several books on cyberbullying specifically. So she's a good uh, link or resource for you. And again, cyberbullying can occur on the internet, but look at all the ways that it can be done through emails, chat rooms, discussion groups, social networking sites, instant messaging, IMing, and web pages. Recall again our discussion of the definition of bullying, that bullying can be direct or indirect. So this intense version of indirect bullying is cyberbullying since it's not done face to face. Nowadays, we know how engaged young people are in using the internet and immersed in, in their cell phones, digital cameras, and other devices, especially for social networking. However, digital messages and images have been sent to cause harm to many youth with devastating results. Cyberbullying has become a significant challenge to parents and other caring adults because it can't be easily detected. Examples of cyberbullying include sending intentionally mean or insulting messages, starting rumors, sharing another's embarrassing information, cruelly excluding someone socially, and pretending to be someone else while posting harmful content. While most cyberbullying behavior occurs after school hours, it directly impacts the targeted youth well-being, excuse me, a targeted youth well-being and their overall school performance. Resentments and fights 
that started online frequently spill out onto our school campus. Among the impacts of cyberbullying, we have several that are shown on the next slide. It can happen 24-7, around the clock. It can be anonymous. It may be more vicious, it usually is more vicious than face-to-face -face encounters. And it's easier to get away with due to the minimal adult oversight of use, use of use of their phone or their computer. It spreads negative text and images widely and immediately. It's difficult to detect and prove without a paper trail. As a result, your target feels betrayed, shamed, powerless, and often again, depression, social as well, occur, or they're common. Parents need training in how to combat cyberbullying. One key rule is not to delete an electronic form of bullying. The first reaction of youth and parents may be to delete the offending message. However, the language and images constitute a paper trail. So if the police must be engaged, they'll need such a paper trail. Remembering that, remember that cyberbullying tends to peak in middle and high school, whereas traditional in-person bullying decreases as students reach middle school and high school. The third form of bullying that we want to speak about today is sexting. Sexting is a term coined by the media and combines those two words, sex and texting. It involves sending a forward sexually explicit photos, videos, or messages of oneself or others from a range of digital devices. Sexting includes sharing unauthorized photos of nude or partially nude boys or girls in locker rooms, sleepovers, or in other scenarios. Most texting, excuse me, sexting tends to occur between young people in relationships. However, when those relationships end, the photos and videos they exchange can be widely disseminated, whether intentionally, and that often does happen, or unintentionally. Youth must be alerted that they can be breaking the law if they create, forward, or even save this type of message. According to federal laws, all sexually explicit images of youth under the age of 18 are considered child pornography. Youth could be convicted of producing child pornography if they take such photos. They could be convicted of convicted of possessing child pornography if they keep copies of nude or semi-nude photos of their peers on their phone or other digital devices. And they could be convicted of disseminating child pornography if they share such photos with others. Any of these could result in a criminal record and requiring registration of a sex offender. Maintaining open communication between parents and youth is vital, but it still may not stop sexting, but it does at least set expectations. Education of parents, youth, and the community of the dangers of sexting is a key deterrent. There are many unforeseen consequences of sexting, and damage one's reputation, this is especially uh, true for females whose images get shared. Bullying and sexual harassment by peers occurs a lot when uh, nude or semi-nude photos of, of young people are, are shared widely or go viral, as they say, including name calling and unwanted sexual advances by others. Um, refuse admission to college and, and employed by uh, lots of teacher employment, youth need to realize that colleges, missions, offices, and employers are looking up applicants online so they can see or find any negative content if it's there. Most young people cannot imagine the range of possible consequences 
if they engage in any aspect of sexting. We have to uh, help educate them and their parents. Next, we'll talk a little bit about just how Native youth with disabilities, how they, um, when they become targets of cyberbullying and sexting, they will often take advantage of unsuspecting Native youth with disabilities by manipulating into cyberbullying another person. They ask them to type things up and so on for them. They can themselves become a victim of sexting. And we shouldn't think that sexting occurs only among high school youth or college age youth. Um, in, in sessions that I've been in, uh, educators are concerned about the number of senior, high, or middle school students who are asking, you know, tricking younger students into disrobing and they take photos of them. So it, um, this, is, this is something we have to take very seriously. They are also, uh, youth with disabilities are also often tricked into downloading pornography, going to sites on their phone or computer that they don't know they shouldn't be on. And the intensity and humiliation of being cyberbullying increases our, our Native youth already high risk for dropping out of school and engaging in suicidal thoughts and actions. Native youth with disabilities are known to use the internet as much as their non-disabled peers. So they are as vulnerable as all youth to being cyberbullied or uh, being sexted and are not sheltered by non-familiarity with the internet. Native youth in general, as I stated just briefly earlier, have one of the highest dropout rates in the country and one of the highest rates of suicidal tendencies are also highest in the nation. When the most vulnerable, of, um, excuse me, most vulnerable among us Native youth, meaning Native youth with disabilities, are so cyberbullied or are a target of sexting. The resulting withdrawal, depression, frustration, and avoidance of peers, school, and social events is intensified for them. What can parent centers suggest to youth to support targets of bullying? The research-based strategies include these six, and there are probably more, but we're just covering these six today. One, reach out. By that, we mean don't allow the bullying target to be isolated. Young people can um, surround, you know, uh, go to the, the young person being bullied and sit with them, talk to them, and again, whether the bullying is taking place in person or online. And that also uh, connects with number two, band together, uh, walk in, you know, in a group uh, to shield the target from bullying. Speak up. Label the behavior as bullying. Say that, hey, you're bullying. That's not cool. And speaking up is important, again, whether the bullying is on, in person or online. Don't join in. Just don't go along to get along. Change the subject or say something positive about the person who uh, they're, they're targeting. Among, again, the strategy can work whether the bullying is in person or online. It's taking place um, on, in person or online. Ask adults for help. If that adult ignores you, find another adult. Again, these are strategies we want young people to remember. And lastly, on the slide, interrupt the bullying. You can say to the target, hey, Mary, you're wanted at home. The office asked me to come and get you. Or, you know, John, um, the, the school nurse needs you, or the, the front office has asked me to come and get you. Do anything to interrupt the bullying. When working with parents, there are strategies that parent centers can suggest to them. 
and um, this is about bullying and cyberbullying in general. We'll talk a little bit in, a, in after I go through these eight. Uh, we'll talk also about cyberbullying and sexting in particular. Initiate conversations about all forms of bullying. Just because the children don't bring up bullying with you, don't assume it's not happening. Initiate conversations about both bullying and cyberbullying. Watch for warning signs. If they're avoiding, trying to avoid going to school, being among their peers, and increase sadness. Also, some youth don't realize that some of their behaviors are forms of bullying. So again, they need to, you need to talk to them, bring up the topic. In the right, upper right-hand corner, parents should not expect youth to solve things themselves. Often we adults say to kids, you know, oh, take, you, you handle it yourself, take care of it. But they don't know how to. They don't know how, they lack the skills to stop bullying. Unless, again, we teach them some of the strategies I just discussed on the previous slide. Uh, but that's why they come to an adult. That's why we tell them to go to an adult. We must know how to identify bullying and cyberbullying. And we have to have the will to stop these aggressive behaviors. A third strategy for parents is to express strong disapproval, disapproval of bullying when you see it, even among siblings. Parents should remind youth that you will not tolerate bullying behavior of any sort, whether at home, in the car, especially among siblings, at school, or online. The fourth strategy is to role play with young people on diffusing a bullying situation and engaging those who are observing, again, the, that's the term known, you know, bystanders. They're known as bystanders. So assertiveness and other social skills must be taught to some youth, especially those with disabilities. We know that that's the case. But we, again, on the previous slide, gave you six strategies that can be shared uh, to young people and especially those with disabilities. We have further strategies, the, uh, the next four um, that again can be taught to parents, should be taught to parents. Develop empathy and respect at home. Create opportunities for siblings and, and other youth to work together on chores, for projects that require sharing and collaboration. Encourage an improved climate of respect within our schools. Researchers use a term called school connectedness. This is the, the definition of this is the belief by students that adults in the school care about their learning as well as about them as individuals. Research on bullying prevention has shown that the more connected students feel to their school, the better they do academically, meaning a climate of respect has been created so you can focus on their studies. And the more connected staff feel to their school, the more likely they are to intervene in bullying incidents. Again, because a climate of respect and caring has been created. Your school's climate is really important and that can help eliminate a lot of this bullying. A key strategy also is to write anti-bullying strategies into your child's IEP. Bullying at school can prevent students with disabilities from receiving a free appropriate public education. Remind parents they, have, they can call an IEP meeting at any time. Write in the IEP new strategies to prevent bullying of your child. For example, allowing your child to leave classes early to avoid hallway bullying. And the last strategy on general bullying is to know your federal rights and file complaints. If American Indian or Alaska Native youth with disabilities are bullied or cyberbullied, for their race or disability, that can be discrimination and harassment, which are against federal civil rights laws. Contact the Office of Civil Rights in the U.S. Department of Education at OCR at edu 
the website shown on your slide. There are four specific strategies on the next slide that parent centers can suggest to parents on cyberbullying and sexting issues. These are the first set rules for using technology. Discuss with your children what's proper and improper to share online. For example, they should not share their home address, their mobile phone number, their any personal photos and videos, and other personal information. We warn our children, you know, stranger danger, and we must heed that we must teach them to heed the same warnings when they're online. You don't share personal information, whether you're on a computer or in person with somebody you don't know. Second one, know what your children are doing online. Parents must be responsible for establishing rules about passwords so you can accent your access your child's cell phone, text history, social networking sites, and other computer accounts. Limit their, their time online. Keep the computer your child uses in an open area where you can supervise online activity, if at all possible. Install parent controls on the computer, for sure. Third, the third strategy is to save the evidence of any cyberbullying and sexting. Again, we have to ignore the urge to delete these inappropriate and offensive texts and images, but you have to save them. Save the chats and instant messages too. Electronic messages leave a trail that can lead back to the perpetrator. And four, file complaints. Most websites and service providers provide uh, excuse me, prohibit online bullying. In an email request to your phone or internet provider, attach the hurtful or sexually explicit content and request that it be removed. These companies can help your child block messages or calls from select senders and even close the cyberbullies account. If the cyberbullying or sexting could constitute a crime, you need to contact the police. In addition to this webinar, NATPAC has uh, published three additional resources you can share. And again, they're, they're listed for you in the handout section on the screen. And um, let's see what American, uh, the informational one on bullying, an informational one on cyberbullying and sexting, and then resources. And uh, Judy alluded to that one early on in the, in the introduction to the webinar, and it lists and describes organizations, websites, publications that intentionally address an American Indian and Alaska Native audience. So please check into these, these three documents. NAPTAC and I urge you to become familiar with these, what we call briefs, that provide you with further information. To use these three documents, as Judy suggested too, you could sponsor bullying prevention training for Native parents and communities and share these three documents with them. When your parent center sponsors an exhibit booth at or near a Native community, display uh, these three documents. It will help Native parents realize that you have an interest in care about them and their needs. And they'll be more willing to approach your exhibit booth or table and engage with your staff. So that's the, the content that I was going to be covering with you today. And But we do have a question. What strategies can you give for students using put-downs a lot? Um, one of the things that, um, again, we, we can ask young people to say, if you have something negative to say, you have to first say something positive. I mean, we all have issues with, you know, with one another from time to time, but if you're, in, and this is important among parents, and in, in, in any kind of a social setting that 
I hear you saying something, you know, uh, you're putting uh, Mary down and um, we don't do that. That's, um, you know, you're bordering on, on getting into bullying and we don't do that. And so you have to say something positive uh, first. Um, and put downs can be very harmful, can hurt. And sometimes they're also very mean, uh, mean intentioned. And so that's, um, that's, um, yeah, we're starting to get it definitely into bullying. Um, when they're mentally um, harming another student, another youth. And, um, if, if any of you have suggestions, uh, additional suggestions, you can add them into the chat room while we have just a few minutes left. Again, NAPTAC is your resource for information about um, assisting Native parents and youth with disabilities who have youth. Okay, uh, there is um, a question. Will the slides in the webinar be made available at the NAPTAC website? Yes, they will be. And for those of you who also want to use this as a training, the trainer's notes will be visible to you so that you can um, use them, add to them, you know, adapt them for your own location. Um, wherever you are in the country. So, I don't see any other questions coming up, so I think that we're done for today. Again, I thank you so much for your interest in this topic and your desire to uh, help our American Indian and Alaska Native communities. And thank you for joining us today.